Hello, my wonderful, beautiful friends. Guys, welcome back to our slash Petty Revenge, where people get little wins on others, and the stories are absolutely hilarious. And in this episode, guys, we've got a Karen that tries to get OP evicted, and it backfires hard on her. Guys, I hope you enjoy the stories today. Don't shake your heads too hard. And as always, you can send or link your post to this email right here. Let's go. So this happened almost a year ago. At the time, I was taking a bus regularly to a hospital for chemotherapy, which left me extremely weak and nauseous. So when possible, I sat in the handicapped section near the front of the bus. Occasionally, people would ask me to move. It's a bus to the hospital, so a lot of people need the disabled seats. And I'm young, and I looked healthy, after my hair started growing back. Of course, they would understand when I explained that I needed the seat. Enter the entitled Karen. She was a smartly dressed woman in her 60s. The woman asked for my seats, and I explained that I just had chemotherapy, and I need the seat because I'm not feeling well. Hearing me say that, she calls me lazy, calls me a liar, and tells me I don't look sick. I'm too exhausted and nauseous to deal with this stuff. I've been trying not to throw up for the last half hour, and the woman screaming at me just made things even worse. I again tried to tell her that I'm feeling really sick, and for her to please leave me alone. And that's when she finally said something about me getting thrown off the bus, and that she hates liars like me. So I decide, F it. And that's when I take aim. I puke all over her nice shoes, and she screams and jumps back. I wish I'd said something witty right then and there, but I was busy puking. She stood quietly, red-faced, at the other end of the bus, and she left me alone after that. In retrospect, I do feel like an a-hole for making the bus driver clean up my puke. I was way too much of a wreck to help. I could barely stand up, though I did apologize to him. It was a spur-of-the-moment decision, and I really didn't think that consequence through. But damn, it was satisfying to puke all over that Karen. Honestly, if I was the bus driver and I overheard that exchange with Karen, I wouldn't have cared having to clean up the puke. In fact, I would be trying so hard not to smirk, just thinking that the Karen deserved it after OP warned her so much. And guys, OP does come back with an update saying that they've been cancer-free for six months now, and they're getting stronger by the day, which is freaking awesome. Ruining Karen's shoes and kicking cancer's ass, OP's definitely winning. This is an old one, but still entertaining. Seven years ago, I moved into a four-bedroom house with three of my friends. I was the only woman among three dudes. One of the roommates was the owner's son. We were all friends in college, and honestly, it was the best two years ever, living situation-wise. We all had different work schedules, and because I worked the earliest at 6am, I had the only downstairs bedroom. My friend, who let's call him Jay, worked the night shift, and he would get home at 4.30, and he had the room above me so we didn't wake each other coming home. During the week, Jay and I would eat breakfast together before he went to bed and I went to work. We had a jar in the kitchen that we would all throw spare cash in, like 5 to $10 bills at a time. That was for common groceries like milk, eggs, basic bread, and the occasional house meals and beer. The rule was that if you used the last of the common stuff, you'd take from the jar to cover the cost and grab it from the store as soon as possible. When we grabbed pizza or I'd make a meal for everyone, we used the same fund. This is all very important. About five months into the living situation, Jay met Karen and started dating her. He brought her to one of our game nights to introduce her to us, to get a feel for how she'd mesh with us. And all was fine when she thought I was the girlfriend of another roommate. Now, because we're playing in the dining room right by my room, Karen saw me go into that room to grab a sweater early in the night. She then saw my roommate, the one she assumed I was dating, go upstairs to grab his phone charger. The entire vibe changed, and she started to ask me who I was dating. She was then floored when my roommates confirmed that I lived there that I had my own room and I wasn't dating any of them. She saved face and she said she was surprised that I'd want to live with three men. And we just moved on. Cam, the owner's son and I were the only ones that realized that Karen saw this as a problem. Little did I know, after that, she was out to get me. After that night, she starts coming over right after I got off work, and only leaving when Jay went to work. If I came out of my room to the living room, she would ask me why I was out there and why I don't just stay in my room. If I was going to the kitchen, she would remark that I was being disrespectful to her and Jay, and interrupting their time together. If I was talking to Jay when she got there, she would practically go and grind on him, and shove her tongue down his throat. She even complained one time that I was ruining the mood for doing my laundry. Jay had made it clear that he knew she was being a problem, and started pushing for them to chill in his room. 
Unfortunately, she used the opportunity to make some of the worst porn imitation noises that any of us had ever heard. We just laughed it off, and we left those two alone. After a couple of weeks, she had gotten drunk before Jay went to work, and we insisted that she stay in his room and sleep it off. I brought her food and Tylenol because the girl was gonna feel like hell in the morning. The next morning, Jay comes home, and he starts making breakfast for me and him, when Karen comes down and she starts screaming at me. She woke the other two roommates up, and she accused Jay of cheating, accused me of having relations with all the guys I was living with, and then she made the dumbest statement possible. She demanded that I pay Jay back for the food that he was wasting on me. So Cam literally grabs a fiver from the jar, and he slaps it in Jay's hand. Cam and I then had a come-to-Jesus talk with Jay. We told him that if she couldn't deal with me living there, then she could no longer come over. Jay asked for a week to figure things out, trying to claim that she was just caught by surprise when she saw him making me breakfast, and she wasn't thinking clearly. So we gave him a week. In that week, mysteriously, the grocery jar was getting raided. We all noticed, and we talked about it. We then noticed my clean dishes were appearing in the sink. Little things were also disappearing from common rooms and weirdly appearing in my room. Karen was being sweet, but she was not exactly covert. Again, Cam and I knew she was being malicious and sowing chaos, but we were curious where this was headed, so we just watched. After a week, Cam gets a call from his mom, asking if I'd been going through something lately. Apparently, a concerned party had sent her picture after picture, and story upon story, how I was trashing the house and stealing from everyone. Karen expected this to get me in trouble, but lucky for me, my landlord was actually worried that I wasn't doing okay, and she wanted Cam to help me get through it. Cam told me this, and I started planning my petty revenge. The first thing I did was eliminate the grocery jar. I split what was in it evenly between the four of us, and told them that because of the raided stash, I felt it needed to go away. Karen did not like this, but when asked why, she claimed it was rude for me to make a unilateral decision. Cam backed me, battle won. Then I started hanging with Cam in the living room every day. She complained that I was always around, but Jay told her it's our house and we can do as we please. When she would go to the kitchen, one of us always asked what she was doing in the fridge. She then stopped going in the fridge after two days. So the weekend was here, and we knew that Jay had this extra overnight shift. And Karen was planning to stay in his room so they could hang out the next day. Cue my biggest petty move ever. And just a little information, Cam and I met in college where we both studied theater, specifically acting. So that Friday, we hung out in his room, right next to Karen's. We made a bit of a show when Jay left, and we acted like he could not know that Cam and I were hanging out alone in his room. And this caught Karen's attention. We then started shaking the bed. And imagine two nerdy people just hip-thrusting the end of the bed to give the illusion that spicy things were going down. It was quite awkward, but oh so entertaining. Within minutes, we get a text from Jay, asking what we're doing. Cam just replied, playing video games. After 10 minutes, we stopped the bed shaking, and we actually did play video games. When Jay demanded a FaceTime session, he saw exactly what he needed to see. Me beating Cam in Mario Party. We cycled through this for a few hours. After a while, we decided to put the finishing touches on. We made a big deal of me needing to go to my room before Jay got home, and Karen took the bait. We could see the little bit of light being cut off in the slightly open door by her watching. Cam and I then pretend kissed, and I head to the living room. Jay came in 10 minutes later to find me watching a movie, which was normal for me, and he asked what was up. I told him that I'd been up all night playing video games with Cam. He then tells me that Karen claimed that we were doing the nasty, and I told him we didn't. He then goes to bed. The next day, Jay calls a house meeting without Karen. He tells us that she's making claims of us having a relationship and hiding it from him. We say she's full of it, and we tell him about the frame job she tried to pull and how she went to Cam's mom to get me evicted. That's when Jay asked our other roommate if he heard anything from the bedroom. Bro doesn't even flinch. He just said, I heard OP calling Cam her bitch, and the usual Mario Party trash talk. They weren't banging. That's when Jay asked about the grocery jar, and we told him we all suspected Karen. The next day, he broke up with her for trying to turn him against us. He called her a liar and a thief. A few months later, he dates another girl. She was awesome, and they're married now. But the absolute best part is that Karen happened to be working a job at the venue as one of the waitstaff. And she saw Cam with his wife and me with my fiancé, telling them the story of how we once dry humped a mattress fully clothed to get back at a thief. And to address the reason why Jay wanted to know if we were actually getting funky, he's the type of dude that hates useless secrets. If Cam and I were hooking up, he would be fine with it. However, if we were hooking up and actively hiding it from him like we couldn't trust him, then he'd have issues. 
That's why we played hard into the J can't know part. Reading this post, I can't help but to think that Cam and OP did J a huge favor, guys, because Karen just seemed like an immature girl who had trust issues and mega insecurities. And also, thank goodness Jay had his head on straight though, and chose his awesome friends instead of this lying, manipulative Karen. That just makes this petty revenge even better, guys, that they all stayed friends in the end. Years ago, we decided to move closer to my parents. The housing choices were slim, but we found a dilapidated house close by. It looked like it needed lots of work, and it seemed overpriced for the area. Say $200,000. We organized a viewing to decide on it, and I brought my very practical dad with us for a second opinion. The viewing was conducted by the owners, and from the very beginning, they were kind of off. They had never sold a house before, and we were the first people to view it, and they actually said to us during the viewing that they were doing us a favor for offering us their hoarder's paradise house at such a great price. We told them we wanted to move closer to my parents, and I think they assumed we were desperate. We got home, had a think, and the next day, we offered the agent a price below the asking price, which we believed to be suitable for its condition. Hours later, the agent calls back, and he says, the owners are gonna prey on it for a week. Then, they'll give us an answer. FYI, this time span is unheard of in my country, and answers usually given in a day. A week later, they decline our offer, and we offer the agent another $2,000. The agent calls back and apologetically tells us that the sellers refuse to give us an answer yet because A, they haven't even started looking for a house yet, and B, the owners believe they can sell it for more than the asking price now. So they'll get back to us when they're ready, and we'd have to wait. We then rescinded our offer. A month later, we find a house in the same area with a lot less work needed, at only $180,000. Our offer through the same agent was accepted, and we moved in four months later. During this time, the agent calls us and says the entitled sellers have found a house now, and they would like to offer us their house at the original asking price. We declined. I was interested in the progress of the old house as the sale sign hadn't moved, so I chatted to the agent. He told me that we were the only offer in six months and that these people had been an absolute nightmare from the start. They expected the agent to pay for the cleaners for the viewings and wouldn't take any advice to help with the sale. Remember, it's a hoarder's house. He also said that they'd recently put a deposit on a house against his advice before selling theirs. So now the old house is going up for auction because they needed the cash. So I instantly called my dad. He was looking for a property for my sister and he'd already seen the house. He was interested. So off we popped to the auction house on the day and we bid for it. The owners were in the room, but they hadn't noticed us. When the hammer went down, dad owned the house for $110,000. He signed off the sale and he paid the deposit just as the previous owners came to the office. Their faces were priceless. I just gave them a grin and left. And this is exactly what being greedy gets you. And guys, this person says they likely got a lot less than $110,000 though. Likely they got dinged $11,000 for auctioneer's fees, as 10% is common, plus 5% commission on the sales price, plus likely another 5% in assorted fees as well. Likely they lost more as well because they had to cover the bond on both, and the sale remainder probably only covered what was left on the bond for the house, and only a small part of the new, leaving them now with another 20 year bond to pay, instead of 10 years. My goodness, talk about a plan backfiring. Now, I typically don't buy a lot of designer clothing, but when I do go shopping, I dress pretty casually. Last week, I was strolling through the mall, and there was a designer backpack on display that caught my attention. So I went inside the store. I was wearing a hoodie and ripped jeans, and I went to inquire about the price of the backpack. I waited around for 10 minutes for someone to help me, until I decided to go to one of the sales representatives myself. She told me to wait because she was helping another customer, so I just sat down and waited. That's when I saw her in the corner of the store, just standing there, not doing anything. I decided to wait another 5 minutes for her to come back, but she never did. That's when I walked back up to her and I told her I wanted to inquire about the backpack. I asked her if she could bring one from the back room so I could take a closer look at it. She just told me that she wouldn't be able to do that unless I was planning on purchasing the item. She just seemed annoyed with my request. Before I could say anything else, she quickly walks away to help another customer. Now, I am quite young. I'm a 25-year-old female, and I could tell that she didn't think I was serious about purchasing it, and she didn't want to waste her time. I would have actually purchased it right then and there if she hadn't been so dismissive. A few days later, I went back into the store. This time, I made sure to dress even more casually than before. I walked in with a pair of sweatpants, running shoes, a tank top, and a zip-up. The same lady was working that day, and she turned her back to me as soon as I walked in. 
I just went up to one of the other sales reps. This guy was younger, smiling, and he seemed eager to help. And I told him I wanted to purchase the backpack. He gladly went inside and he got it for me. He even asked if I'd like to take a look at it before buying it. I thanked him and he checked me out. The store manager was also by the cashier. And I let him know that I came in last week and that that lady wouldn't let me see the product before purchasing it. He was upset to hear this and he told me this wasn't the first time he'd received a complaint about her. The item was a few thousand dollars and all the commission went towards the junior. He was so kind and grateful. As for the other sales rep, she avoided eye contact with me after she got told off by her manager, and I just smiled at her as I walked out the store. Don't judge a book by its cover. You know, I want to say that hopefully that sales rep learned a lesson, but I don't think she will, guys, because some people just have it in their minds that the ultra-rich often look ultra-rich. And I've said this before, it's very easy to look rich, guys. Anybody can buy a few thousand dollar wardrobe on a credit card and secretly be tens of thousands of dollars in debt. I just love the fact that OP came back looking even more casual than the first time, and then she just drops a few thousand dollars on the bag. This person says, that woman obviously hasn't worked there long. One of my friends, who worked for a high-end designer store in Vegas, said that women who came in dressed to the nines in designer stuff usually spent like $2,000 to $10,000. But the big spenders who spent $20,000 or more usually came in wearing sweats and casual clothes, looking like they were, you know, spending the day walking around the mall shopping. So this guy's a very entitled veteran, and supposedly a purple heart one. He's also a very racist dumbass, which is one of the reasons my boss will not absolutely have him as a customer during business hours. But he'll work on his truck after hours with no one else around. The usual MO is he tries to fix something on his truck, and he apps it up, and then he expects everyone else to fix it for really cheap, using his veteran status as a guilt trip, because he's already done half the work himself. This time, he came to us, and he fixed his brakes, and somehow no longer had rear brakes, and his truck is two bolt failures away from a junkyard. My boss is out of town, so I was in charge for the week, with strict instructions not to help him while he's out. Well, the guy shows up at the shop today, demanding I fix his truck. I'd already closed the building up, and I was ready to leave, and I told him when boss gets back, he'll fix your truck. The guy did not like that answer, and he said a racist remark, and I told him to F off until boss gets back. So the guy gets pissed, and he grabs a piece of wood, and he throws it into the desert. I start my drive home, and a second or two later, I notice his truck behind me, and he's matching my lane changes. I live 40 miles away, so I knew he wouldn't keep up with me in the hills, and I didn't want to kill him by outpacing him. So I call my friend, who's only 9-10 to miles in the middle of the desert, and I told him I was gonna swing by because I think I'm being followed, and I was gonna take the scenic route. My friend told me he was gonna meet me at the halfway, and if he had to, he would scare him off. Now, the scenic route is 7 miles of rough desert road that'll destroy any truck without long travel suspension. A lot of locals use it to test and tune their desert off-roaders. So I get to the turnoff into the trail and I see his headlights turn in behind me. And at this point, I just shut my lights off and I turn on my desert headlights and I floor it. And I make sure to lure him into the first set of jumps. Right before the jumps, I kicked up a bunch of dust and then turned off all the lights and waited at the other end. I could see his headlights again, and I could tell he cleared the first jump. But I could see his headlights shake going down, which is a sign of suspension failure from hitting the ground hard. I then turned on all my lights, so he could see where I was, as I left and proceeded to my friend's location. He was waiting for me with his brother, and a big grin on his face. He told me he saw me about a mile away, because of the lights, but couldn't see the other truck behind me, and he just said, looks like he must have missed the first jump. I'm gonna call rescue. We hung out another few minutes, and then took a different trail that led me to the highway home. Later that evening, I get a call that he was fine, but that his truck was bent at the cab and bed from the 5 foot drop he experienced. He said he got lost going home. I plan on calling my boss in the morning and letting him know that I'm having that dumbass trespass from the shop for pulling that stunt. Update, my boss has been contacted, and he's taking my side on this, and he's no longer welcomed at the shop. He's been formally trespassed by the sheriffs, and I also saw the truck. It's literally bent, with the bed and the cab pressed into each other. And it's sitting at another shop. You know what they say, guys. Play dumb games, win dumb prizes. That's all I can say. And funny how the guy's excuse for getting his truck totaled is apparently he got lost going home. 
And you know what? That's highly believable because sometimes when I'm going home, I'll often take the wrong turn and end up in the middle of a desert as well, guys. With that said, I also think they need to do more than trespass him because that guy sounds like the kind of crazy bastard that'll come back after stewing on this for a while and will cause a lot of trouble. Hopefully he doesn't, though. So today, I got a call from the school that my 9-year-old attends asking to please come to the school because my daughter was in trouble for vandalizing another child's property. Now this did surprise me because my daughter's a bit of a goody two-shoes and she never gets in trouble, so I dropped what I was doing and swung by the school to find my daughter sitting in the principal's office, grinning ear to ear. I was ushered in to take a seat. The principal immediately launches into a tirade how my daughter had broken another girl's necklace and how unacceptable it was. He said an accident is one thing, but my daughter did it on purpose. Once he was finished, I turned to my daughter to hear her side of the story. Last year, my daughter saved up her pocket money to buy best friend necklaces for her and this girl. I ordered them from Wish.com for her. This year, the friendship went belly up when I discovered this girl was trying to extort my daughter into buying her expensive items on a kid's game with threats, backstabbing my daughter, and threatening anyone who dared to play with her at lunch, so she was completely isolated. My daughter cut off contact and she's been rebuilding her friendship circle and all's going well until this little girl starts repeatedly demanding that my daughter give her the other half of the friendship necklace so she could give it to somebody else. The fact that we were the ones that bought the necklaces to begin with was apparently a minor irrelevant detail. My 18-year-old niece and nephew are very protective of their young cousins. They were quite upset for her, so they decide to offer the opportunity for therapeutic destruction. Last weekend, they got out their tools, and they helped my daughter shatter the charm into 7 or 8 pieces with a hammer, some pliers, and they had a great time. My daughter then put the pieces in a box as a reminder of what fake friends can do to you. Anyways, apparently, this girl kept demanding the necklace every single day. She was hassling her, so my daughter hatches a plan. She gathered up the pieces into a little bag, and she took them to school today. She then emptied the bag in front of the girl and told her she was welcome to the necklace as long as she likes jigsaw puzzles, but she'll probably need some glue. Apparently the girl went red and she stormed off to the teacher to say that my daughter had destroyed her necklace and that's why my daughter was sent to the office. I couldn't keep a straight face, I just burst out laughing. You could see the vein in the principal's forehead pop out as he looked at me laughing. I then pulled out my phone, showed him my purchase history to confirm that we bought the necklaces and that my daughter's perfectly within her rights to destroy her own property, if she wishes. He finally dismissed us and my daughter skips back to class, laughing hysterically. My niece and nephew are quite proud and they're planning to take my daughter out for ice cream this weekend to celebrate her standing up for herself. Absolutely brilliant revenge, right? And really, there's nothing better than the sweet, innocent revenge of destroying your own stuff to mess with someone else. And if I were in OP shoes, I would be one proud parent, because obviously that girl's gonna grow up to be a confident young lady who knows how to deal with bullies. And I just want to add that I also love the fact that OP's daughter was confident enough to know that she wasn't gonna get in trouble when her parents showed up. And that, my friends, brings us to another end of our slash petty revenge. Guys, I hope you enjoyed today's stories. I hope you didn't shake your heads too hard. And if you missed the last episode on the channel, it's an r slash entitled people episode where OP's jealous sister demands her baby and she won't take no for an answer. It's a wild story, so go check it out if you haven't. And myself and Stevie Boy will see you guys in the next one. We love you.